Hello, everyone, and welcome. Let me thank the organizers for this great event. And tonight, actually, it's night for us here in Nicosia, Cyprus. Um, we have an excellent session by three excellent uh, masters of forecasting, namely Professor Spiros Matridakis, Vangelis Spiliotis, and Vasilis Anagnostopoulos, Asimakopoulos, and they will be going over the M competitions and specifically the M5 competition um, as it is uh, really of great interest for all of us and all of you to listen and enjoy. Okay, let's get started. Professor Makridakis, the floor is yours. Well, good evening, good morning, and good, good afternoon, I guess you are from a lot of the world, so Maria, could you uh, so what I will do, I will share this presentation with Vangelis. I'm going to start, Vangelis is going to take the mid part and then I'm going to finish. So let me share my screen. So probably you have heard about the M5 competition. It started in March, beginning of March and finished in the end of, um, June. <laughs> Went to the end, unfortunately. Let me go back. Okay. So I I would like to start with some just some, some general ideas about forecasting competitions, what the forecasting competitions have been doing. I don't think I can do as well. Let me full screen. I don't think I can do as well as what uh, Rob has done and probably you all know his famous paper, A Brief History of Forecasting Competitions. I think he explains better than anybody I know about forecasting competitions. So Rob can talk a lot about research direction, performance, parameterization, methods, implementation and data. Rob has done an excellent job and his paper, and his paper is uh, open access, so you can you can download it at any time you want. The forecasting competition started uh, before the 1980s. We wrote a paper with uh, Michelle Bon, which was published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. That was before starting the competitions, and we found some strange results there for that time, where the Bob Jenkins methodology was supposed to be the king. We found that simple methods, for instance, simple exponential smoothing, was more accurate than Bob Jenkins that was extremely complex and sophisticated and statistically based. The basic problem with the method was overfitting. At this time, however, we didn't know about overfitting. And then the reason that uh, they told me the book, the book checkers did not do very well is because we didn't know how to use it. So for me, to, the only way to show that actually we're not the ones who made the mistake was to start the first competition, the M competition or the M1 competition. It was a small competition. We only had seven participants. The number of seats was not bad. We had 15 methods plus nine variations, and we used many accuracy measures. Well, what happens, we found exactly the same results that we found in the, my study with Michelle Bond. So at this time, what we're told is that the reason that the sophisticated methods did not do well is because you cannot run them on a production basis, so we have to give forecast is the right to adjust them, the methods and incorporate information from the economy and from the companies. So we did that. We selected 29 series. Most of them came from companies. We tried 60 methods. We did it on real time for two consecutive years. And what we found again it was that uh, forecasts did not improve the accuracy of the statistical methods. 
and judgment did not do anything. And again, we found that simple methods perform better in most cases than sophisticated ones. Then, a few years later, we started the M3 competition. By this time, computers were getting bigger and faster, so we could increase the number of time series. We used 24 methods. And basically, it was the first large-scale competition that became the de facto comparison of forecasting research and used extensively by practitioners to decide which methods to use. The major findings, basically, we confirmed the results of the previous two competitions. A new method developed by the theta method developed by Vasilis and with a lot of help from Bagelis and Focusing Pro were introduced. They did a little better than the remaining of the methods, but nothing really changed very much. Also, what we found was that uh, neural network methods and machine learning methods did not improve forecasting accuracy. And we came to the M4 competition that there was a big step forward. There were 100,000 time series, 61 methods, including 12 benchmarks, and the first M competition to evaluate uncertainty around the point forecast. Our major finding was a hybrid method developed by, by Slauer and Smeal, provided more accurate results, about 10% more accurate than the benchmarks, the method by Montero and Manso and the other people from Monas improve accuracy. Combinations still offer excellent results. And uh, the finding that was one of the most encouraging was finally this, the two first, the top two methods estimate uncertainty correctly in an amazing extent. There have been some other forecasting competitions. There was one using employing neural networks, and there were several competitions from Kagi. Again, you know, nothing really exciting happened in this. And the, the work has been done a lot of work and a lot of competitions, in particular about sales forecasting. It was by Kagel, and there has been an excellent paper by Bozer and Melgard that describes this six comp competition, this single kind of competitions. And what we're going to talk today a lot, Pagels will explain to us in great details, will be the M5 competition that was started in the beginning of March and ended at the end of June of this year. And Vangelis, you start. So I have to give you, you do I need to give you control of the screen, Vangelis, or you can do yes, it? Yes, sir. Yes, I need the control of the screen. You should okay. uh, stop sharing. I did, I did. You share so you can continue now. You're still sharing your screen. You have to. We're still stop sharing. Okay. okay, I stop sharing. Okay, good. Okay, let's take it from uh, where Professor Makridakis left it. Uh, I'm going to provide some details about uh, the EM5 competition. As Professor Makridakis uh, told you, we were uh, strongly motivated by uh, the comments that we received from uh, the commentators and uh, the uh, reviewers of uh, the M4 main paper um, and uh, also uh, the um, the comments of uh, Rob Hyman in his uh, excellent uh, paper about the history of uh, uh, the M4 competition. 
Um, so we tried basically to address the limitations of M4. Uh, first of all, we included a large data set of more than um, uh, 40,000 uh, hierarchical time series. We introduced several benchmarks, both for the accuracy and the uncertainty uh, track. And uh, uh, we also uh, tried uh, to keep uh, replicating the results, sharing the code of the winning submissions. Uh, we focused on a special forecasting application this time. In the previous M competition, we mostly focused on low frequency data, for example, uh, yearly, quarterly, and monthly. In this competition, uh, we moved to daily uh, forecast sales. We try to use uh, some uh, more objective uh, measures for both uh, competitions, and as I said, we also introduced a highly correlated series because uh, in the m competition, we had uh, mostly unrelated series, so it was um, more difficult, let's say, to transfer uh, some learning from one series to uh, another and allow for machine learning methods to, um, to learn from uh, the data set. Uh, so we have uh, also explanatory variables like uh, uh, special days, events, promotions, the prices of the products, and we also uh, moved from a, a single pred a prediction interval used in the M4 competition to nine um, individual quantiles. So the, let's say a few things about the data set. The data set uh, uh, can uh, consist of some uh, group series. Uh, so, basically, we're talking about hierarchies, but uh, for uh, products that cannot uh, be organized in a single way. Uh, we have uh, 3,049 products classified in three uh, different product categories, hobbies, foods, and household, and also uh, seven departments, which is like uh, a subcategory to the above mentioned categories. And we also have uh, some uh, geographical criteria for uh, organizing the data, 10 stores uh, in uh, three uh, US uh, states. So uh, in total, as you can see here, we get uh, 12 possible uh, aggregation levels. Uh, and since uh, we, we believe that uh, all levels could be of particular interest for some decision makers, we decided to evaluate the forecasting performance across uh, all the levels, uh, putting um, the same weight in all levels. Uh, we also uh, used some um, uh, additional information uh, about the special events and holidays. This account for about 80% of the data set. Uh, SNAP activities, which is um, uh, like promotions, okay, some. Uh, uh, reductions in price um, for people in need. This accounts for about 33% of, um, of the data set. And then we have information about the uh, changes uh, in the prices. So as you can see here, and this is one thing to keep in mind, uh, as we move downwards, we have uh, more disaggregated data. We talk about product store uh, or product uh, uh, series and as we move uh, at the top of uh, the uh, of uh, this table, we have more smooth and uh, less series per level. This is how the the, the data look like. Uh, I provide some indicative examples here. With uh, the, the 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 black line is uh, the total sales. We can see that we have uh, multiple seasonal patterns and also some uh, trend. Uh, the same is true for um, the categories. Uh, but uh, as you can see, there are some differences uh, between uh, the categories or the states or the departments, etc. This is uh, how the seasonality looks like when uh, you examine uh, on a week basis. Okay, so strong seasonal patterns uh, on uh, during the weekends and also uh, some strong seasonal patterns to, uh, across uh, the months of uh, the calendar. Okay, uh, mainly 
uh, the sales are higher during the, the summer period. So these are things uh, that um, forecasting models should keep in mind. Also, we should keep in mind that the, for the first time ever, we have a competition with uh, strong intermittency and uh, erraticness, especially at levels 9, 10, and 12, especially 12, the, the lowest aggregation level, we talk about intermittent and uh, uh, lumpy series, so uh, more difficult, uh, a far more difficult uh, forecasting task to uh, perform and deal with uh, all these kind of uh, anomalies and uncertainty. Let's move to the rules of the competition. The, the competition was hosted by Kagu. Uh, it's an online platform where uh, thousands of uh, uh, machine learning experts and practitioners compete. Um, another rule was that uh, everyone had to provide it to provide forecasts uh, for all the series of the competition. However, it wasn't mandatory to compete in both of the forecasting challenges, the, the accuracy and the uncertainty one. And in order to collect any price, you also had to provide a reproducible uh, code. This was also uh, recommended even for the non-winning methods. Some participants um, actually share their code, although they didn't uh, win. Uh, then we have uh, two phases for running the competition. We call it the validation and the test phase. Uh, the validation phase um, ended on May 31st. Uh, during this period, you basically had um, uh, 1,900 days of available data to train your model and we kept uh, 28 days after this uh, train set in order to uh, provide some feedback uh, to, uh, the to the competitors. However, the competitors didn't know what the actual values of uh, this uh, validation set were in order not uh, to overfit and get some uh, meaningful feedback. Then, uh, for the last month of the competition, we provided the data used for the validation period and we asked the participants to submit their single uh, final forecasts with no feedback provided. We asked for a single set of forecasts since in real life we, you do not have the opportunity uh, to make several forecasts, although this is something that is uh, usually done in Kaggle. Here are the uh, evaluation metrics of the competition. For the accuracy competition, we used uh, a variant of the well-known uh, maze proposed by Heinemann and Keller. Uh, this was done in order to uh, better approximate the mean of uh, the future values. And we also decided uh, to use uh, a weighting scheme uh, so that uh, all aggregation levels have the same value. Uh, so decision that differ to different uh, aggregation levels have uh, um, the same weight. However, uh, the weight of each series within each aggregation level changed depending on its value in terms of uh, uh, dollar sales. Okay, so we basically multiply the unit sale with uh, the price and get a, a figure of how important in monetary terms uh, each uh, series is. For the uncertainty competition, we used uh, the pink ball loss uh, function. Uh, again, we uh, weighted, we used the same weighting scheme uh, for getting uh, the final score. And we also focused on the nine different quantiles, uh, the 50%, 67%, 95%, and 99% prediction intervals plus the median. So we get uh, a, an evaluation where we approximate the um, uh, complete distribution by focusing both uh, in the middle parts of uh, the, distrib the distribution and um, the tails of the distribution. We do not evaluate the complete distribution, with, but I think we get a nice approximation of it. Here are a list of the benchmarks. Uh, I won't uh, uh, talk about it uh, in more detail. Uh, but uh, we basically use some standard uh, methods that uh, were, uh, have been 
you, we've been using for years for predicting uh, intermittent demand data uh, and generally supply chain management applications. Uh, I, uh, we've also considered some reconciliation approaches, both top-down and bottom-up, some standard uh, standards of comparison like the ARIMA and uh, the ETS method, the exponential smoothing, and finally some combinations. In total, 24 uh, benchmarks. And six uh, benchmarks for the uncertainty competition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are not that many benchmarks to, to use for, uh, for, for, uh, for estimating uncertainty. I think we have a lot of work to do here to establish some well-known uh, benchmarks for estimating uncertainty. And here is a list of the prices. Uh, we'd like to thank once again the, uh, our sponsor, sponsors, Google, Google, uh, the University of Nicosia, Walmart, that also provided uh, the data for this competition, Uber and uh, IIF. In total, uh, we had uh, prices of $100,000, equally divided across the two competitions. So let's move to uh, the uh, participation in each uh, competition. Uh, here you can see uh, how many participants participated uh, per country. In total, we have uh, uh, more than 7,000 participants uh, of uh, uh, five and a half, five, five, uh, thousand fifty hundred teams from 101 countries. Uh, this means that in total we had uh, almost uh, 90,000 submissions. Uh, most of the participants did a single submission in the competition, but uh, others did several submissions, uh, especially uh, given that they were receiving some feedback during the validation phase. Here are the, how, how the teams entered the competition. Okay, as time passed, of course, the number of participating teams uh, increased. However, you can see that uh, after the uh, validation set was uh, released and uh, there was no feedback received, the submissions uh, drastically reduced because there was no feedback to get from the leaderboard. Uh, so they just you know, recalculated, uh, they recalibrated their models and decided to make their final submissions in the last days of the competition. Here is uh, uh, a density plot providing information about uh, how uh, the scores of uh, uh, the teams uh, were finally in the competition. I provide the scores only for those that did better than the naive benchmark. This accounts for almost half of uh, the participants, 48% uh, to be more accurate. Uh, it's uh, also interesting that only 35% of the participants did better than the seasonal naive benchmark and just 8% of, of the participants did better than the top performing benchmark of the competition, which was the uh, bottom-up implementation of the uh, exponential uh, smoothing. It is also uh, important to note that uh, uh, during the before the end of the competition, there were uh, actually many participants that did better than their uh, final submission. They had better scores, but they failed to select their best uh, submission. So this uh, is something to consider, and um, I think uh, we uh, we have to focus in on this area and develop best uh, better practices. Uh, in order to uh, not uh, get uh, misleading uh, validation scores. Uh, and here are the uh, improvements reported for uh, the methods that did better than uh, every benchmark set. Uh, the improvements reach uh, almost uh, 80 per, uh, more than 80%. Uh, so, uh, bigger improvements than the benchmark when compared to the M4 competition, substantial improvements, and uh, also some clear uh, victories for uh, the five winners, which were uh, the only teams that had an improvement greater than 20%.
Here is uh, the uh, ranks of uh, the competition. You can see the first five teams. Uh, I also have a line here to denote that uh, these were the, uh, at the golden position at uh, the Kaggle leaderboard. You can see that we have uh, something like 16% improvement, still 22.4% improvement over the best benchmark. Uh, here you can see some box plots uh, that uh, summarize the performance of uh, the methods per aggregation level. Uh, with uh, the green dot, you can see the score of the winning submission of the competition, and with the red dot, you can uh, see the top performing benchmark. I see that, uh, I think that there are two uh, important things to report here. First of all, we can clearly see that as we move to, most, uh, to more disaggregated data, uh, the uncertainty increases and therefore the, uh, the forecasting error increases. Uh, and another interesting thing is that um, although we have some clear, some clear winners here at the more aggregated levels, okay, uh, here at the disaggregated levels, uh, the, the differences between the winning submissions and uh, the benchmark become insignificant and also in some cases uh, the benchmark is even better than some of uh, the top 50 performers. So more work to be done uh, here for predicting the um, irregular series and less work to be done for the smooth one, which are easier to predict. Here are some significant tests for uh, the uh, predictions of uh, the M5 competition. Again, the top 50 performing methods here. Uh, basically, we analyze uh, the average ranks of the methods for the complete data set. So we basically test uh, if a method is uh, um, significantly uh, more likely to provide better forecast for uh, each series. An interesting thing here is that uh, the, the winners of the competition, I have noted here uh, with uh, the red color, the top three performing methods, do not provide the, uh, the, the, be the best ranks, uh, the best average ranks uh, in the competition. Uh, this, has, uh, this is uh, closely related with the weighting scheme used in the competition. So uh, this, uh, the, the winners actually put more emphasis on uh, predicting well the items that are of uh, higher value and uh, less emphasis on those series that are not that important. Okay, so uh, this, this is a, a different question if I want to predict uh, more accurately at every single series or, uh, you know, uh, provide better forecast for the series that are uh, more important. Here is a brief description of uh, the, um, uh, of, uh, the winning submissions. Uh, the first, the winner used uh, a, a gradient boosting tree, an implementation called Light GBM. Actually, almost everyone in this competition used uh, this kind of uh, method. Uh, however, uh, the winner did uh, this uh, in the most appropriate way, probably. Uh, it also used an ensemble of uh, two, more than 200 uh, different models of uh, this kind and use an effective validation procedure to select the best approach. Matthias also used like GBM with external adjustments. We have also some uh, applications where we use uh, recursive deep learning uh, models or combinations of uh, uh, like GBM uh, with neural networks. Here are the same information for the uncertainty challenge. Uh, we have uh, much uh, fewer teams here. Uh, instead of 5,000 participants, we have 1,100 less, less people uh, interested or capable. I don't know which of those two is uh, more true uh, for uh, dealing with uh, uncertainty uh, from 94 countries and nine, uh, almost 10,000 submissions in total. Again, similar conclusions can be drawn for the way the, the participants entered the competition. Uh, 
uh, most of uh, the submissions were made uh, during the validation period. And now uh, we can see some comparisons with uh, the naive and uh, the best benchmarks used in the competition. Uh, as you can see here, the, the results are better for the participants. Almost everyone did better than the naive benchmark. 62% uh, did better than the yes naive benchmark and uh, almost uh, more than 20% did better than the ARIMA, the best uh, performing benchmark of the competition. However, again, uh, many people failed to select as uh, their final submission the, the best uh, submission they ever made during uh, the competition, while the competition was active. Uh, the improvements uh, over the benchmarks are more significant uh, in the uncertainty competition. Uh, we have uh, more than 25% improvements for the winning uh, method and uh, also uh, more than uh, 200 teams that did better than uh, the benchmark with an average improvement of uh, 15%, so substantial uh, improvements. Here are uh, the runs. Uh, in this competition, there was also a winner from uh, for the week for the um, student prize in the accuracy competition. The, the winner was a student, so he collected both uh, prizes. Here we have uh, the student of the team Cajo that won uh, this uh, um, that, that uh, won this prize. A similar analysis is performed here per aggregation level. The conclusions are uh, almost identical. Uh, we have uh, uh, clear winning methods for the most uh, for, for, for the uh, most aggregated uh, levels, but uh, at levels uh, product, product state, and product store, we can see that the benchmark becomes uh, much more competitive uh, to the winning submissions. Here is a similar analysis, but uh, at this time I focus on the confidence level. Uh, again, here you can see that um, the, the benchmark, uh, the, the best benchmarks do uh, much worse than the top 50 performing methods. So we have better estimations for the middle part of the distribution. But when it comes to uh, the right and uh, the left tail of, um, of the distribution, and particularly, uh, you know, the, uh, the end of the, the, the tails here of the distribution, the uh, performance of the benchmarks and the submissions, um, the top performing submissions become uh, comparable. And here is the same analysis, but at this time we focus on the coverage rate. So uh, we basically evaluate how close um, the, the coverage of uh, each method was when compared to the, to the nominal value, to what was uh, the optimal solution in this case. You, you can clearly see with the purple is uh, the nominal coverage, you can clearly see that we have a, a perfect performance here for the middle part of the distribution and also a very nice uh, performance for uh, the right tail of the distribution, but uh, here it seems that um, there was uh, some trouble from, uh, from the top performing methods to uh, actually uh, calibrate well uh, their results. They uh, undershoot or overshoot uh, in many cases. Similar conclusions when we uh, use the MCB test for significance. Uh, we can see here that, uh, again, the, the method that provides the, uh, the, the best average rank is not the, the winning submission. So a high impact here from uh, the weighting scheme used and the focus of the winning submissions to the most uh, important um, units of uh, the competition. And here is a summary of uh, the winning methods. Again, we have uh, lots of teams uh, using the light GBM uh, method. 
with some variations. Um, we, the winner also used some oversampling techniques to better uh, train uh, his model, which provided forecast for each quantile and aggregation level separately. The second best method used again like GBM with some techniques uh, to, uh, prov to extract the quantiles uh, through uh, histograms. And then we have uh, some uh, LSTM neural networks that directly provide uh, the, um, the quantile or estimate uh, the distribution through uh, residuals uh, and combinations of those. So two different schools here, either gradient boosting or uh, LSTM neural networks to get the forecast. I think that uh, now it's time to uh, give uh, the floor again to Spiros Makridakis, who will provide uh, um, a summary of the conclusions of the competition. Okay, one second to try to... Try to get... Sorry, I'll go there. Okay, so the key findings. There are 10 of them. I'm not going to go to each one of them because we'd like to get some time for questions. Um, am I... Can you hear me? Yes, we're yes, all good. Okay. Sorry. So I'm not going to go to each one of them. One of the most important things is that uh, what Bagelis already said about the excellent performance of the light GBM method. It's amazing how well it did. And I'm going to talk more about it in my next slide. What are the implications about it? Again, the value of combining the potential of neural network methods, something which became very, very clear that he started with them for competition became much more clear with them five is the value of cross-learning, cross both straight and in terms of um, using it in comparison, in comparing it or rather together with their robustness which is the number seven, the importance of explanatory variables and exogenous variables. Now, one of the things that they did well in the uncertainty competition is to try to find the median using the accuracy measures and then use the median to estimate the remaining probabilistic forecast and uh, the benefits of external adjustments and the significant difference between the winning methods and the benchmarks. Okay. Now, what I would like to spend more attention is what are the implications of them five for practitioners. And the most important is a fundamental change from statistical methods that we then find in, in all of the previous ones. We found that they were the most accurate, simple machine learning methods. And I guess at, that, at some future point, we have to, to establish that it's not only for retail sales data, but it's going to, it's going to extend to other series. Now, what are the implications of this? We get now a major shift from technical experience and expertise in running the forecasting method needed a great statistician to be able to do the job. Getting everything done now by the ML method. Vigelis mentioned that the data has multi-seasonalities. Well, the ML method can figure out all of the seasonalities. It can figure out all of the details to get the best accuracy of the most precise estimation of uncertainty. Now, in 
up to now we had the fact that we needed a very good statistician to do this job an experienced statistician who has a great knowledge of forecasting well in the accuracy competition a student an undergraduate student won the competition this guy had little experience in running machine learning methods and non non experience in forecasting and he managed to win the same thing happened with the uncertainty challenge we get students there is a one student the first or one of the two students got a course in machine learning in 2000 and he managed to beat all of the other students and a lot of uh, came i think fifth or sixth in the uncertainty competition that's a very big change so now where we're going to get improvements where we're going to get the competitive advantages of people or companies that would like to improve the accuracy of their forecast it has to come from having more data more reliable data better explanatory variables exogenous variables I think that we're going to see a shift now going from what's going to be the most accurate method because the most accurate method is going to come by itself through the algorithm. How we're going to adjust this machine learning forecast judgmentally with information that is not including the machine learning algorithm. And something which I think we're going to have to put a lot of research is breaking the black box of machine learning methods because we don't know what comes out of it. We get the data, we get the forecast, we don't know, we get the best forecast, we don't know why this forecast is bad. And one of the things we have been trying to do with Vagelis is to try to find out where the improvement in accuracy comes by comparing it with benchmarks, the different benchmarks that we know the, how they work. Now, another thing which I think we have now to spend more time, since the accuracy is going to become automatic, we're going to get it automatically, to look at uncertainty and try to compare uncertainty to risk and stop believing that uncertainty is too wide and and informative to be used for making useful decisions. This is absolutely ridiculous. And now that we have good ways to measure uncertainty, we have to try to figure out how to consider its implications to risk and avoid unpleasant surprises. And then move beyond normal uncertainty, fatal uncertainty, something that Nassim Taleb is talking for a long time. Now, I would like to finish by talking to you about the special issue of the International General Forecasting, which is going to be devoted exclusively to the M5 competition. And this is a call for proposals and finding to the global forecasters, IIF. And uh, another thing is tomorrow we're going to have. Uh, a virtual conference about giving the awards and having some talks about M the M5 competition. So if you want to, I'm going to make an announcement if you want to participate, we're going to give the name of the blog to participate. And thank you very much for your attention and for whatever time is left, we're going to be open for questions. I think. Uh, Vagelis, would you like to go through the questions? Yes, yes, we have a question from Tim. He mentions the the 2018 paper of ours in PLOS One, where we uh, basically said that uh, machine learning methods are not better than uh, statistical methods. Um, and the question is what changed um, 
from uh, from uh, this paper what changed our way of uh, thinking and uh, i think the, the the main difference with what we did in this paper was that uh, we uh, basically trained the machine learning methods in a series by series um, uh, uh, strategy okay so we did not apply uh, we did not transfer any learning from uh, the data set uh, to the rest uh, to to to, uh, to the forecast it wasn't possible to 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 relate uh, and exchange information uh, between the the series in the end for this the time Vangelis cross learning didn't, was not part of the forecasting process also yes. we found the same thing in the M4 competition we found that the machine learning methods did not do very well right so i i the, think the, that the, the pure the pure machine the learning methods and what i said is that Eventually, now we're going to see a shift uh, from statistical forecasting to machine learning forecasting. And another thing is that in the M5 competition, the series were uh, more related to each other. So cross-learning approaches uh, did much better and it was uh, more possible to train this kind of methods than in M4 where basically each series was mostly unrelated from, uh, uh, from the rest and also not chronologically aligned. So I think this is, uh, this is the uh, two main differences here, cross-learning and uh, um, correlation between the series. I can't see any other question, but uh, if, We have a question from Nikos. Where can you see them? It was a great to use Kaggle. Uh, uh, he, he talks about uh, a possible bias that, might, that may occur to the results, uh, given that uh, uh, most of the methods submiss submitted were machine learning. Uh, I think that uh, more than 90% in, uh, uh, in uh, the submissions in the M5 competition were machine learning or at least included some uh, kind of uh, machine learning in it. So this is uh, a fair observation. However, uh, from uh, reading the, the forum while the, the competition was still running, I found that many people uh, started with some statistical methods, they experimented a lot with uh, uh, reconciliation and hierarchical forecasting as well and uh, they couldn't uh, just uh, get some scores uh, close to the ones that uh, the rest was uh, receiving with machine learning methods so uh, after some point uh, most of uh, the teams started using machine learning methods there might be a bias but i think that many people tried and they find they were uh, uh, forced, let's say, to move to machine learning approaches. Uh, Pierre asks uh, if uh, we have played with combining entries from the uncertainty track. This is something we want to do, uh, Pierre. We did this uh, for the uh, accuracy competition. We combined uh, some of um, the winning methods and we found some uh, improvement there uh, not not that much something like three percent over the the winning submission uh, but we will do this yes we will definitely do this uh, for the uncertainty and see if we can uh, get anything uh, out of it especially There's for a question from chris fry when will be the m6 competition well hopefully the moment after the end of this period, after the end of this month, we start thinking about the M6 competition and we're going to want ideas. And Chris, if you can have any ideas, send an email or let's have a Zoom meeting because I think that M6 will be my last competition. So I would like it to make it a big finale. There's a question also about the award ceremony. It will uh, be held tomorrow and we will uh, 
uh, uh, post in the WOVA app uh, a link in order for anyone interested to join and uh, the ceremony will be also recorded and um, uh, uploaded in YouTube for anyone interested to join. So it's not part of the ASF, it's, uh, it's an event supported by uh, the IIF and we will be happy for everyone to, 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 to join us. What do you say that M6 should be about pandemics? That's a Is good one. <laughs> That's a good idea. Always great ideas from Fortis. Yes. Fortis is the person for to talk about the special issue together with the Gamis. Michele, there's a question from Olva. From all the way at the bottom. Okay. Let me let me read it a minute. Uh, if you've done any analysis on the team rankings between final and yes. previous submissions and so on, uh, th this is uh, this is uh, something uh, that uh, uh, we've uh, been uh, working. Uh, I think that uh, uh, for 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 th this this is actually a, a project. I don't know if uh, George wants to to say something about it. Uh, because we, we talked uh, about these ideas, uh, comparing uh, the performance of preview submissions with uh, uh, the final ones, uh, identifying biases. Uh, we can, um, I, I can say that uh, it seems that uh, the more uh, the teams submitted, the better their final performance was. But uh, this was uh, not always the case. There, there was some pattern. It seems that it was some pattern there, uh, but not uh, that strong. But we have to, to analyze further. What uh, we, uh, we are sure that it was the case based on the result was that uh, uh, the teams that had very powerful uh, validation approaches uh, using several uh, windows to validate their approaches did much better than uh, those that used random sampling uh, or uh, a few uh, weeks to test their data. And uh, actually the winner was the only one that considered about, apart from uh, the average accuracy in this rolling origin evaluation, uh, the robustness of, of, of uh, the forecast. So instead of saying I will select what it seems to be the most accurate approach, I will go for one that seems that it's not always that accurate, but at least it does not uh, give me that much variation in my final score. So there are some things here to, to, to see. So you can mention regularly that it is a work in progress and watch this space the paper will coming out soon, or at least a working paper. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there's a paper that's going to appear in Foresight about the winning method and how he managed to win and what are the implications of this about the future of forecasting. But this guy, I mean, he started a year and a half ago getting involved with data science and he has absolutely no knowledge of forecasting and he managed with a to win the competition and beat all of these masters and grandmasters. And this tells us something about where the field of forecasting is going, right? Finding the most accurate forecast is going to be something mechanical that's going to be done by the machine learning method. We have a question and by... Yeah, so we have a question by Mark D. I don't know whether you answer it. I don't think you have. Could you please talk about the decomposition method application? How can we extend them by machine learning method during the time we have different decomposition method? I don't, I don't really get the thing about the decomposition. I don't understand what is the idea of decomposition, what he means by decomposition. Machine learning methods don't decompose, right? 
they do everything in one black box and they give you bum the answer. Let's maybe move to the next one and Mark can follow up with you uh, in person. Just one more. Let's go to maybe Tim. What is the next big challenge or problem field in forecasting, in your opinion? Which domain should be covered in the next M competition? I don't know if you've answered, you've touched upon COVID, but would you like to add to that? And what do you think commentators will want to see now? About the future of forecasting or about... Uh about future of M competitions, I guess, or what domain should we cover? Well, we, we have to find some different ways to get competitive advantages out of forecasting, uh, in my opinion, because the, the, the method is going to be the work now that uh, the expert statistician needs to do. And, this thing is going to be automated. The same way that we don't do exponential smoothing anymore. The state space approach of Rob is doing it and finds the best method. The machine learning now, it, it expands it and takes any pattern of data and it's going to find the best model and the best and the most accurate forecast and the best estimation of uncertainty. So we have to, to look for another job if we don't want to get away if you, do, if you want to stay in what you just passed. Okay, um, I think we should wrap it there. It's, it's uh, on the hour. Um, thank you, Spiros. Thank you, Vagelis. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Um, thank you. We should uh, you, jump over to the keynote and join Henrik's um, uh, uh, keynote. And George, thank you for the great job that you did in organizing everything. You have been doing a great job in Greece and you continue doing even a more superb job with this virtual conference. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Spiros. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.